thine, O Lord, and I have heard thy voice and it told your love to me. Oh, but I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Let's just stand together and sing that. Draw me near. Jesus. 
Jesus be seen in you. Oh, and let the beauty of Jesus be seen, seen in me. Oh, His wonderful passion and pure. God bless you. Let's bow our heads together and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we come before you once again. And God, we're looking to you as the all-sufficiency in our lives. God, we've come to you, Lord, to worship you and to sing your praises. And Lord, we count it a privilege to be able to do so. God, there was a day that you were entering into Jerusalem and they were singing Hosanna to your name. And Lord, they wanted them to be quiet. The Pharisees tried to stop them, but he said, if they be quiet, the rocks shall ring out. God, we can't do anything but sing your praises, for somebody must declare your glory in this world. And in this earth, Lord, you revealed yourself to us. What can we do but declare your glory, magnify your name? And it's our privilege, Lord. And now we come, Lord, to feast on your word. We just ask, God, you would open another portion of yourself to us. Instruct us in the way of righteousness from your word. Lord, take this vessel under your control that I might be yielded to you and that you might have control and speak your word and your word only. And may, Lord, we feast on that and grow stronger by that portion. We ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. While we're standing this evening, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation. And I just want to uh, say I heard from Brother Emmanuel that he got back from Pittsburgh for ministering for Brother Jean last Sunday, and and the services went well. He was on his way here this evening, but he got caught in a hailstorm and had to turn back. So uh, we just trust that all is well with him, and we can see him on Sunday. Also, uh, Brother Kyle Weichert, he'll be traveling this Sunday to uh, go minister for Brother Jean as well. So we want to pray for he and his family. And then I want to remind you that this Sunday, Brother Burley Williams will be preaching for us. So we want to keep all of these things in prayer for Brother Kyle and his family for traveling mercies and ministry there, and Brother Burley for the same coming here. We're very much looking forward to having him with us again. As we're standing with our Bibles, let's look at Revelation 19, verse 7. Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. Now let's turn to chapter 21. Chapter 21, verse nine. Let's read there next. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. May God bless you as you have your seats. May the Lord bless us as we look into his word this evening. Amen. Amen. Without his blessing, it would be impossible. Without him giving us eyes to see and ears to hear, we would be just as lost. But I thank God he's promised, amen, that he would help us in this hour. Amen. We look at these two scriptures, and I I grab these just to show that without question, the lamb has a wife. Amen. Amen. The lamb has a wife. There's no question about it. We read in in chapter 19 that she's made herself ready. And in chapter 21, the seventh angel was going to show us the lamb's wife, the bride, the lamb's wife. So the lamb has a wife. Amen. I think that's really important. So that's what we want to talk about this evening is the lamb's wife. Amen. How many wants to be that? Amen. That's our desire to be the Lamb's wife. We believe by revelation we are, but it it means a lot to say something like that. And I wanted to read a quote from Proving His Word just to show where we are in time. We know it really well, but I'm going to lay it down uh, once again. He said, Jesus says, as it was in the days of Sodom and Sodom. Now watch close. In the days of Sodom, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man when the Son of Man is being revealed. Not no more is a church, see, not no more. The bride is called, see. In that day, the Son of Man will be revealed. 
what? To join the church to the head, unite the marriage of the bride. So the, rev- the revealing of the Son of Man is the coming of the Son of Man to do what? To unite the head and the body, to unite the bride and with the head for the marriage of the bride. The bridegroom call will come right through this when the Son of Man will come down and come in human flesh to unite the two together. The church has to be the word, he is the word, and the two unites together. And to do that, it'll take the manifestation of the revealing of the Son of Man. Not a clergyman. Oh, I don't know. Do you see what I mean? Brother Ram says it's not a clergyman, so you don't look at him. It's not a preacher. He said it's more than the preacher. It's more than the clergyman. It's more than the man. It's the Son of Man coming down. He's working through that flesh, of course, but it's the Son of Man. He says, not a clergyman. Oh, I don't know. Do you see what I mean? It's Son of Man. Jesus Christ will come down in human flesh among us and will make his word so real that it will unite the church and him as one, the bride, and then she'll go home to the wedding supper. Amen. She's already united, see. We go to the wedding supper, not to the marriage. Uh, this is the purpose for me reading this so we can get this point here. Amen. He, so he goes to quote a scripture, fill yourself of the flesh of mighty men because the marriage of the lamb has come. But the rapture is going to the wedding supper. When the word here unites with the person and they two become one, then what does it do then? It manifests the son of man again, not the church theologians, the son of man. The word in the church becomes one. Whatever the son of man done, he was the word. The church does the same thing. Amen. This quote is so monumental because it tells us where we are in time. Amen. And we are now in the marriage of the Lamb. The marriage of the Lamb has come. The marriage is taking place right now. So the Son of Man has come down into flesh, not a clergyman, but he's he's using that flesh to manifest himself. It's the revealing of the Son of Man to make his word so real that it'll unite the head and the body. It'll bring the marriage of the bride and the bridegroom call will come through this. And he said the marriage is taking place now. Now, the invisible union is taking place now. The rapture will be going to the marriage supper. Amen. So that's why when we talk about the lamb's wife, amen, it's important to know that the marriage is taking place now. Amen. We're not talking about something future when we talk about the lamb's wife. Amen. But he's taking his bride to himself now. This is the dispensation we live in where he's uniting with her and he's uniting one by one as, as, as the members of his body gather together, they're uniting with the headship of Christ and the marriage of the lamb is taking place. Amen. So that means, that means the lamb has a wife. But wife brings with it, a, the term wife brings with it a whole set of responsibilities that are different than just bride. And that's what we want to talk about for a little while. And we might continue on. I don't know how much we'll get done, but, but it just keeps unfolding as we go. So the term wife, when we come to the term wife, amen, we have, you have bride and you, you can be talking about uh, uh, an engagement phase uh, and, and a phase leading up to marriage, amen, but, but when you talk about wife, it brings a whole new set of responsibilities and a whole new set uh, of, 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 of responsibilities and issues, amen, that we must administer. And so uh, my, my wife was my bride before she was my wife. But now that she's my wife, she's still my bride. I'm still a bride. But I believe by the union of Christ, I've become the lamb's wife, part of that wife. I'm not it in a whole, but we are many member, many member body. And so because I believe that to be true, amen, the, then the question is, am I willing to take the responsibility of wife that's different than just bride? Not girlfriend phase, not engagement phase, amen, but now the wife, what responsibility is that? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2 and keep laying a few scriptures in here. Genesis chapter 2. And verse 23. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. All the way 
to the New Testament to the Apostle Paul writing to the Ephesian church. Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm going to read verse 29 to 32. Ephesians 5. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Now he goes right back to what, what Adam just said. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So he says in verse 30, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. I don't know how more specific he can be that we are part of his body, amen? And so this is what Adam said would take place in a marriage, and this is what uh, the Apostle Paul is saying is taking place in the marriage, that we become part of his flesh, of, of his flesh, of his, let's see here, I want to get it right, but members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones, amen, we are united with him. Amen. Now we've come to the, to the marriage of the Lamb, praise God, and he speaks a great mystery. It looks like marriage, uh, earthly marriage, but it's only typing the union between Christ and the bride, and they are to be one flesh. Brother Branham says, not, well, I'm sorry, not Brother Branham, but the angel of the Lord told him to pick up his pen and write, and I'm going to read this from the church age book and just read just a sm small segment. It said, notice the harmony of the Father and the Son. Jesus never did anything until it was first showed him by the Father. This harmony is now to exist between the groom and his bride. He shows her his word of life. She receives it. She never doubts it. Therefore, nothing can harm her, not even death. For the seed be planted, the water will raise it up again. Here is the secret of this. The word is in the bride as it was in Mary. The bride has the mind of Christ, for she knows what he wants done with the word. She performs the command of the word in his name, for she has thus saith the Lord. Then the word is quickened by the spirit, and it comes to pass. Like a seed that is planted and watered, it comes to full harvest, serving its purpose. Those in the bride do only his will. No one can make them do otherwise. They have thus saith the Lord, or they keep still. They know that it has to be God in them doing the works, fulfilling his own word. He did not complete all his work while in his earthly ministry, so now he works in and through the bride. She knows that, for it was not yet time for him to do certain things that he must now do, but he will now fulfill through the bride that work which he left for this specific time. I find this quote fascinating, amen, because it wasn't Brother Branham just receiving a revelation or even seeing a vision. It was actually the angel of the Lord told him to pick up his pen and write, and he was writing and not even knowing what he was writing until he stopped and he, and, and, and he took it out and he had to read what he just wrote, showing that this is a message from the angel of the Lord to us. Declaring to us that there was something that Christ did not finish in his earthly journey. He left, he left, what did he leave it for? For the other part of himself, for the other part of his body. Those who have members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. He left that part of the work for them to do. Amen. And now in order to do that work, she must come under the headship of Christ, which is the fullness of this word that's been restored. And she must have thus saith the Lord, amen, which is the word. And she must have that or she keeps still. What's it showing? She must come to the place of, of a submissive wife, of a perfectly submissive wife in order to fulfill this commission. She can't fulfill it on her own. She can't fulfill it without his headship. She can't fulfill it without being submissive to her headship. Amen. But yet it must be fulfilled because it was left for this specific time. It's not going to be left undone. He's not going to not finish any of his work, but he's going to finish it. But he must have a, a bride. He must have a wife who comes under the submission of headship in order to finish this work. That's why it's different to be a, a wife than just a bride. Amen. Because the wife now comes under the headship of her, of her husband and she must come under complete authority of her husband. Amen. Sometimes we wonder why we preach headship and why we preach submission and, and the roles of man and the roles of a woman and the roles of a husband and the roles of a wife. Amen. Because our earthly marriages must be a reflection of this image of Christ and his bride. Amen. And it's not just preaching it to so, so we can have men who are egotistical and, and they get to dominate over the women. It has nothing to do with any of that. It has everything to do with keeping the picture of the Bible pure and straight. And that's why Brother Bam said one of the most horrible things on earth is a dominating woman. 
Why? Because it's the spirit that's in the Catholic Church. It's the spirit of denominationalism, a dominating woman. Amen. It, it ruins the entire picture because the only way that God can finish his work, amen, through Christ is for her to take on the headship of Christ and come into submission to that word, regardless of her thoughts or feelings or ideas. Why? Because her husband, Christ, Jesus Christ, when he was here, he had to come under complete submission to the headship of the Father, and only then could he finish his commission, his part of the commission. Now the further part of the commission, the work that he left for this specific time, can only be done if we come under perfect headship, amen, to our bridegroom. Amen. So it's different than girlfriend, boyfriend. It's different than the, the, the stage of the butterflies and the excitement and the enthusiasm, amen. Now it comes to the place where, where we get down to the reality of life. Yes. Amen. I, I, as I told you, I said, I believe it was when I was in Australia, I said it like this. Uh, Everybody wants to be a bride, but nobody wants to be the wife because when the honeymoon's over, after the, after the big day and the pageantry and the flowers and the decorations and the beautiful music and the, and, the, and the woman being the center of attention, the beautiful dress and all of that, amen, after the honeymoon's over, you come back and, and somebody's got to do the dishes, somebody's got to pack the lunch, somebody's got to wash the clothes, amen. It's not all fuzzy feelings all the time. It's not all glory and it's not all pageantry all the time. Sometimes you get down to the work of being a wife. Amen. And it's about service, submission. It's about sacrifice. Brother Bram said in the token, he says, Jesus was baptized by John. And the Bible said, and they saw the Spirit of God like a dove coming down upon him. Therefore, if it would have been a wolf, or if it had been any other animal, the nature of the dove could not have blended with the nature of the wolf. Neither could the nature of the dove blend with any other animal but the lamb. And those two natures come together, then they could agree with each other. What if the dove had come down and instead of it being a lamb, there would have been some other animal? It would have quickly have taken its flight and went back. But when he found that nature that he could blend into, it just became one. And then the dove led the lamb. And notice, it led the lamb to slaughter. Now the lamb was obedient to the dove. No matter where it led, it was willing to go. And so now Brother Bram's showing a, a picture of that day on the, on the banks of Jordan when Jesus was baptized and the Spirit of God descended like a dove and it rested upon the lamb. And he mentions it several different places. He said that dove could not rest on anything with the nature, an aggressive nature or the wrong nature, a wolf or anything else. It could only rest on a lamb because they had the same nature. And when it rested on the lamb, then the dove became the leader of the lamb and the lamb followed the leadership of the dove, amen, because, because the lamb is a follower, a lamb is submissive, amen. So now the dove couldn't descend anywhere else, but it said, notice, and, the, it, and it led the lamb to slaughter, but the lamb followed along. Now the question is, if the lamb has a wife, what kind of wife will the lamb have? If the lamb has a wife, then his wife will be a lamb. Because there's no high breeding. There couldn't be anything else. There couldn't be any other nature. There couldn't be any other kind of animal. If the lamb has a wife, then his wife must be a lamb. Oh, praise God. And we know that the, uh, that the dove, the Holy Ghost, could not descend on any other nature, only on the nature of the lamb. But we live in the day, amen, when, when, when the Holy Ghost is descended in full measure at the opening of the word to rest where? On lambs, amen. It's coming back on the lamb. To do what? To lead the lamb. In Matthew 4, 1, it says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit unto the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When Jesus received this Holy Ghost, when the dove came and began to lead him, where is the first place the dove leads him? The dove leads him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. What a leading place to lead the lamb. But the lamb is a sacrificial animal and he's a submissive animal. So if we want to be the bride, what kind of nature should we exhibit as the bride the same that Christ had? Amen. So where can the Spirit lead us to? 
The question is, where will we, where will we be willing to follow the dove to? We will follow the dove to blessings. We may follow the dove to church. We may follow the dove to special meetings. We may follow the dove in blessing and reward. Are we willing to follow the dove into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil? What if that's where, that's, what if that's where the dove wants to lead? Are we going to change nature and stop being a lamb if the dove wants to lead us into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil? Are we going to be the lamb's wife and have the same nature of the lamb? Because there's no high breeding. So if he's the lamb, we have to be a lamb. And if the, and the dove leads the lamb, then can the Holy Ghost lead us today into places we don't even in our flesh want to go? Amen. Jesus in his flesh, I'm sure he didn't want to go fasting 40 days and afterwards being a hungered. And when he was hungered, now being tempted of the devil with all of these temptations. But he had to pass the test. Amen. So now, are we willing to be a wife? To go, to go anywhere our bridegroom goes. Are we willing to be a wife? I mean, before, before we're a wife, before we say yes, we can, we can weigh things out, you know? I'm talking in the natural. We can look at it, we can look at a young man. If there's a young man interested in a young woman, she can sit back and she can say, I mean, what, what kind of nature is he? Does he have a good job? What kind of home will he provide? Amen. Where does he live and what's he doing? And, and all of those things she can consider. But the day she says yes and she takes those vows, amen, she is now under the headship of the man, amen, and her days of choosing are now over because she's accepted the headship of this man. If he moves, she moves. Amen. If he loses all, her, all his wealth with a poor decision, she's lost all her wealth. She must stick with him. Amen. Is that true or not true? And then if that's true in the natural, what's true in the spiritual? Amen. If, the, if this is the way the lamb's going to walk, which way is the lamb's wife going to walk? If he passes through troubled water, what is she going to do? Say, I'm not going there. I'm going back to mom and dad. She's not going back to mom and dad. She's married to the lamb. Amen. Amen. That's why sometimes we want the benefits, amen, but we don't want the sacrifice. We want the, we want the label and we want the day of glory, but we don't want the day of sacrifice and surrender and submission. But if he was a lamb, she'll be a lamb. Amen. It'll be the nature and our nature is being changed to the nature of the lamb. Amen. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm going to look at verse 29. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. For whom he did foreknow he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I thank God that he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. It's our only hope. But yet we know what the destination is to be conformed into the image of the son, to be like the lamb. Amen. We know that we've been reading in 2 Peter 1, we've read it several times now, the last several times we ministered, how that He's given us precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. Amen. Adding to our faith virtue and all of these things all the way up to the capstone, which is love. So what are the divine promises? By these we're to be partakers of the divine nature. To what? To come into his very nature. The nature of what? The nature of the lamb. Amen. And so that's what we're called to in this day. And let's go to Ephesians 4. And we're going to look at the same thing. In Ephesians chapter 4. Because this is the work of the ministry now. Ephesians 4.11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The destination is clear. 
What journey are we on? We're coming into his image. We're coming into the image of Christ. We're coming into the image of the Lamb. That's what the ministry is supposed to be producing for the edifying of the body, for the perfecting. Amen. So we all come into a perfect man and until we come into the the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What are we coming here Sunday and Wednesday and Sunday and Wednesday and Sunday and Wednesday? Why, keep, why are we doing this? Because the word is molding us into the very image and nature of the lamb because we're the lamb's wife and we must reflect the lamb. And so we have to keep getting molded and molded into his image. Why? Because the destination is clear. We're moving to the capstone, which is love, which is God. God is love. And he's got to bring us into his nature. We must reflect on this earth the nature of the lamb. Because why? We're the lamb's wife. And so we, we can... We can want to do so many things and we can want to be so many things and we can think of a, 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 a great powerful move in the end time, but the most powerful move that I can think of is God taking the people under absolute, under control and having preeminence and doing only what he says. Amen. Not going off on our own ideas and not trying to conjure up our own and solve our own problems. Amen. Because that's not what the wife is to do. She's to become submissive to her husband, not to solve her own problems, not to, not, not to take her own ideas, but she's there as a help me to her husband. Amen. To take his vision and his plan and help manifest it in the home. Amen. That's why I think it's, it's so important Amen, that we understand what nature that we're under, and if we're the lamb's wife, we're also a lamb. Amen. Uh, Do you remember the story that Brother Branham told of those two young couples that he married? We've talked to it many, many times. But the one was the rich couple, one was the poor couple, and he took the poor couple, and, he, and they come to his uh, front room, and he married them in his front room, and he was poor, and she was poor, and they didn't have enough money to hire a preacher, and, and his brother, Doc, told him, my brother will do that, and right, and he come right into his living room, and, and they were shabby, and she hardly had any shoes on at all, or hardly had a dress, no shoes on, and, and he married that couple. And he's comparing and contrasting it with the rich couple, but the part that always stands out to me is when he comes down to the, to the point when he wants to check up on them. And he goes along as, as he's acting like, he says acting like he's checking the, the electric uh, poles and the insulators on the poles. And, and he gets up close and we know about the rich people. They were fussing and they were fighting and they had everything. But he comes up to this little home here that had nothing. It was in shambles. And he, and he starts to listen and he hears a conversation and he peeks through the crack in the door and he sees her sitting on his lap and they've got an old hat turned upside down. They got a little bit of money in there and they're counting so much money for groceries and so much for insurance and so much for that. And Brother Bam said they didn't have enough to meet the ends. And then he said, oh, I, I want to buy you that dress so bad. And she said, oh, I don't need a dress. The one I got is fine. And he says, but you look so pretty in it. And she goes, oh, I don't need it. And Brother Bam said when he looked through that crack, she was sitting on his lap, he had his arm around her, she had her arm around him, and they really loved one another. And Brother Bam said he looked from there, he could see the steeple on the house up on the hill, and he said, William Brandon, which one would you want? He said, I'd take that character down here. But what was it? She took the same nature as her husband. What happened on the hill? Amen, that woman took the same nature as her husband. He was jealous, he was spoiled, he was selfish. And what was she? She was jealous and she was spoiled and she was selfish. He chose one that reflected his character and then she was molded into his image and she was reflecting back to him what he was. Amen. But this one down on the hill, that's why I think it's so detrimental, amen, if you ever start criticizing your husband or start criticizing your wife, amen, you're on dangerous ground because you are to be one. And you start tearing him down, amen, that's who you're supposed to reflect. And you start tearing her down, and she's your reflection. Oh, my goodness, what we need to do is get on our knees and say, God, help me get this right understanding, amen, because something's not working. Amen. 
So now this little one down, this, this little couple down here, she was a reflection of him. He was sacrificing for her and she was sacrificing for him. He didn't, he didn't want a new fishing pole. He didn't want new fishing lures. He didn't want to take a vacation. What he wanted to do with the little bit of money he had left over is he wanted to buy her a dress. What was he doing? He was sacrificing for her. You know what? She had the same nature of him. She wasn't saying, well, just let the insurance go. Amen, I'll take the dress. That would have been the wrong nature. That would have been the nature for the woman on the hill in the ivory palace. But she was reflecting her husband. When he sacrificed for her, she sacrificed for him. And what did Christ do for you and I? Amen, what should we do for him? Amen. What right do I have to be selfish and take and never give back? Amen. And, and want the showering of praises and all the things that come upon me. But I don't want to give myself to the ministry and I don't want to give myself to Christ and I don't want to give myself for the furthering of the kingdom. Help us, Lord Jesus. You know, Brother Brenham asked this couple before they got married, he says, what'll happen if you run out of work and you run out of money? Are you gonna send her back to mom and dad? He says, no, we'll struggle right along. And he asked this young woman, he says, what'll happen if he loses his job and he can't take care of you anymore? Are you gonna run back to mom and dad? And she says, no, I'll stick with him. And Brother Branham said, it made me feel little when I saw that they really loved each other. So sad, friends, when Christ doesn't give us everything we want and we're willing to walk away. When Christ doesn't answer every prayer request and we get angry and get upset. When Christ doesn't give us everything we want and we start to pout. And the question is, which kind of wife am I reflecting? The one on the hill or the one in the boxcar? Amen. We've got to realize that I'm married to the lamb. I'm not my own. I'm not here for myself. I'm not here to find my own way. Listen, you know, you know how horrible it is? What a terrible picture it is when a man will come home and he's worked all that he can work and he's done all that he can do and, and, and his wife just wants more. I want more furniture. I want more goods. I want more this and I want more that. And he says, honey, I've done all I can. I can't do no more. And she says, well, I'll just leave the house, go get a job and I'll buy it for myself. We've just marred the image of Christ and his bride. Why? Because you're taking it into your, this is what the church has done. They've taken it into their hands to provide for themselves. Well, we'll just have a program and we'll just have a school and we'll just do all of these things ourselves. Amen. Why? They're not waiting on God to do it. And if God doesn't do it, saying, hey, that's fine with me. If now's not the time, if we don't have the money, amen, if, if you decide, Lord, that it's not a good time for us to have this, then we say, you know best. Amen. So we talk about, you know, you know, Brother Branham even preached on women working, but he also, he was balanced in all things. He wasn't legalistic in it. He, he, he even commended, amen, a few women in his church who were working and they kept their honor and integrity even at the manufacturing plant. And from the pulpit, he gave them honor and respect for that. But he said they were helping their husband build a house. Right? So it's not about just, it, that's not it. It's not about just working or not working. What it's about is keeping the image right, amen, not making our own money so that we can make our own decisions. I make my money, I make my own decisions with the money I make. That completely ruins the image of Christ and his bride. That is the wrong kind of reflection. So Brother Branham, when he was talking about these things, he was talking about the image of Christ. He was talking about why when he explained these things, amen, because the home must be a reflection of Christ and his bride. Every marriage must be a reflection of Christ and his bride. Amen. But when we want to go provide for ourselves and we want to, if we're told no, and then no's not good enough. I mean, it, it's, it's detrimental and what it shows is 
Everybody wants to be a bride. Nobody wants to be the wife. Remember, I think I was thinking about this when Brother Simon Abbott was here last, last, and Brother Simon said, everyone wants to be the queen, but no one wants to bake the cake. I was sitting in an airplane when I heard that, and I was laughing out loud. Everyone wants to be the queen, but nobody wants, nobody wants to do the hard work. But Christ was willing to sacrifice for us. Amen, we pull bad attitudes and People will leave church because they didn't get their way. People will leave the message because they didn't get to do what they wanted because the message was a hindrance to what they wanted. How is that the nature of the lamb? Amen, what about sacrificing? When a woman comes to a marriage, amen, now she gives her body to this man. Why? Because he's going to make his family, he's going to make his home. And when she receives his child, amen, all of a sudden she's given herself completely over to this man. He's going to reproduce himself and produce his family. And she gives her body completely to it. She gives up her comfort. She gives up her sleep. Her diet changes. Her body changes. Everything changes because she submitted to her husband. And now to she's supporting the family the bringing forth of the family, amen, and she gives her, she has to give her all to it. What should we be doing, amen, for Christ to reproduce himself, amen, Christ has a bride, and he wants to minister, amen, to his children through his bride, amen, and we can't be selfish, but we must give ourselves. Even giving ourselves to one another, amen, for the nurturing up of God's children, amen, what about sacrificing for each other? Amen to make a home, praise God. You know, Brother Branham says in It's the Rising of the Sun, he said, Satan doesn't care how religious you are, how right you are in your doctrine. If you miss that life, you won't come up anyhow. No matter how religious, how good, how many churches you belong to or will belong to, it doesn't matter one thing unless you've been born again. Why, you've got to have that life on display. We know the quote really well out of Revelation chapter 4 when he says, oh, how we need in Jeffersonville thousands of lived voices. The thunder of God thundering out in sweetness and holiness, purity, undefiled lives, walking around in the earth today without a blemish. Yes, sir, real Christians, that's thunder against the enemy. The devil don't care how loud you holler. The devil don't care how much you can jump or how much you can do this or shout. But what hurts the devil is to see that sanctified, holy life, consecrated to God, say anything to him, call him anything, just as sweet as it can be and move right on. Oh my, that throws him away. That's the thunder that shakes the devil. Listen to what he just said. Amen. When it hurts the devil is to see that sanctified, holy life, consecrated to God. Why? That was the lamb sanctified, holy, consecrated to God. That's what hurt the devil that day. What's going to hurt the devil today? The same kind of life in her. What was in him being in her is what's going to shake the devil. And then listen to what he says. Say anything to him. Call him anything. Just as sweet as can be. Move right on. Oh my, that throws him away. That's the thunder that shakes the devil. We say, if I could preach like Billy Graham or Oral Roberts or somebody, a great influential speaker, oh no, sometimes the devil just laughs at that. He don't pay no more attention to that than nothing. You get all the theology you wanted and all the seminary training, and the devil just sit back and laugh at it. But when he sees that life, what life? The life of the lamb. Where? In her. The same life reflected in her. That's what he's trying to get preeminence to do now is he's trying to bring that life into a body. He got preeminence in the lamb. Now is he going to have preeminence in the lamb's wife? I believe he will because he promised he would. Amen. When I, when I looked at this subject, when I was thinking about it, meditating on it, I went back to the marriage vows. And I look back at the marriage vows that we take in, in that that we use when we, when we marry a, a man and a woman together. And we say, I, and whatever the bride's name, take thee, whatever the groom's name, to be my wedded husband. To have and to hold from this day forward. Man, that sounds so good. I take you to be my husband, to have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. 
in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. According to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I give thee my pledge. What we do when we come to this marriage vow is we pledge to one another, I'm not just here for the good times. I'm not just here for the blessings, and I'm not just here when it goes right. But I pledge myself to you that I'm here for richer and I'm here for poorer. If you lose all your wealth, I'm sticking with you. Amen. Like he asked that young woman, amen, what if, what if your husband here, what if he loses his job? You going back to mom and dad? She goes, no, I'll stick right with him. If we go through poverty, if we miss meals, I'm not running away because I've pledged myself to him. Oh, praise be to God. How should we pledge ourselves to Christ, amen? Only for richer, only for better, only for the benefits, or are we here in the good times and the low times? You know, Christ didn't come to earth just for the highlights, amen? He came down to be spit upon. He came down to be rejected. He came down to be mocked. And why did he do it? He did it for me. He sacrificed for me. And if the lamb sacrificed for me, his wife, the lamb's wife ought to reflect his image right back to him. Oh, praise God. God, help us, amen, to come to the realization and the reality of this because I don't want to be a fair-weather Christian. I want to be the real deal, amen, if I pass through poverty with my Lord. You say, how could he? He owns the cattle on the thousand hills, but sometimes he's got to bring us down into the valley, amen, to move somewhere else, and it comes down to a, a, a time of without, a time of lacking, a time of suffering, amen, and can I walk with him in a time of suffering the same I can walk with him in a time of blessing? Can I trust him the same? Can I stay submissive to his word the same? Or am I going to start getting discouraged and quit coming to church, amen, and start doing other things, amen, because why? Well, I'm just so down because times are so tough and things are going wrong and nothing goes right for me and I got discouraged and I quit coming to church. Why did you give up on Christ? He never gave up on you. What about your pledge to be a wife and stop being a girlfriend and be a wife, amen? When times are tough, don't leave your husband. When times are good, don't leave your husband in sickness and in health. But I'm sick and he didn't heal me and I got discouraged and I quit coming. Why did you give up on him? And is this his word that tells you to come to the con congregation, to the fellowship? Why dishonor him just because of a poor time or a sick time or a worse time? Does he not know how he's leading? Can we not trust him in all things? Christ suffered for me. Can I suffer for him? He was rejected for me. Can I stand rejection for him? If you if you've proclaim this message long enough, you've been rejected for it. And this message is Christ. He was rejected for me. Can I be rejected for him? He was stepped on and he was mocked and he was made fun of and he was called Beelzebub. Can I be called names for him? It's, it's coming down to the reality. I, I just can't help it. It's just the reality, friends. There's a, there's a scripture that I've been meditating on that I want to bring to you. But first, I want to, I want to go to a couple other places and then I'll get to the scripture. In the, in the uh, Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Brother Bram said, Satan said, he's talking about the temptation to Eve. Oh, you know, but she turned around and listened to him. But the Eve in the last day is not going to do it because she's predestinated not to do it. Listen, the only hope I have the only hope I have in making it and not failing is because he predestinated me to make it and not fail. Not because I have any ability to do it myself, but this is the hour we live in when his bride will be on display. Because she's predestinated not to, yes sir, God's going to do it, he knows. He'll have it, he said this, his church would be here without spot or wrinkle. She is going to stand there in the splendor of him, his word manifest. She'll be a token to the world. She'll be a token to the world, something that they can look at. And then let's go to 2 Corinthians now. 2 Corinthians. I still haven't got to the scripture I'm meditating on, but we'll get there. 2 Corinthians 
chapter 3, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. It says, Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, I love that, the epistle of Christ. That means you're the letter Christ wrote to the world. The epistle, uh, uh, the epistle to the Ephesians is an epistle, a letter of Paul to the Ephesians, to the Corinthians. But you're called to be the epistle of Christ, the letter of Christ. For as much as you're manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be his love letter, his letter, his epistle written to the world. Not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on stone like it was on Mount Sinai, but engraved in our hearts. And we're to be a display of God's word. Now let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7. First Corinthians 11 and 7. For a man that need ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Amen. The woman is the glory of the man. Amen. What kind of glory should we be for him? The woman is the glory of the man. When we talk about the two couples that Brother Branham married, the woman on the hill was a reflection of her husband's character. And she was declaring to the world what kind of man she was married to. But the woman down in the boxcar, she was a reflection of her husband's love and sacrifice and surrender. And she was sacrificing and surrendering and loving back. She was his glory. Amen, when I read that story and I, and I see her response, uh, you just know she had a good husband. You just know she had a good husband. She had a husband she loved, a husband she could trust, a husband who sacrificed for her, a husband she could have confidence in. You know she has a good husband. How do you know she has a good husband? Because she's reflecting her husband. Her character reflects his character. Her conduct towards him is a reflection of his conduct towards her. Amen. And what kind of glory am I bringing Christ in my life? Amen. I want to be a written epistle. I want to be read of all men. I, I desperately want the Holy Ghost to come and write in my heart that letter so it can manifest not my own glory, not my own desire, but his glory. I want to be the lamb's wife. I want to be a lamb. Amen. In the masterpiece, Brother Bram says, notice the bride. If the bride in the beginning was the word of the bridegroom, and then if the bride is is taken from the bridegroom, it must be the word also. Notice the bride must be. Why must the bridegroom be the word manifested and made plain? Is because the bride and the bridegroom are one. She is just a smitten piece off of him. There is the masterpiece. She, she must be a reflection of him. If he was the word, she must be the word. And now, let's go to John chapter 11, and I wanna share with you this thing that I've been meditating on for weeks. Sometimes you just get a scripture in your mind and just roll over it and roll over it and roll over it and it begins to strike deeper and deeper. In John 21, let's go to verse 18. And we know this is after the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. He comes uh, to find them fishing on the sea and he speaks to them and Peter swims the shore and all of those. Then he starts to ask Peter, Peter, does thou love us me more than these three times? And, and, and he says, feed my sheep. Then after that, he speaks to, to Peter again in verse 18. He says, verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkst whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee uh, Gare thee whither thou wouldest not. He's speaking of his death because he's going to be crucified. So read that again. Say, I say unto thee, when thou was young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not, because he's going to be crucified for Christ. 
Look at verse 19. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. So interesting to me. That phrase starts getting in my heart and I can't get it out. Signifying by what death he should glorify God. You mean Peter was going to glorify God by death? By being crucified? By being turned over to authorities? By being tried as a criminal and being crucified? That's how he was going to glorify God? I wonder by what death I could glorify God. Maybe by the death of self. We think the only way to bring glory to God is through supernatural feats and through all these other things, but there was a death that Peter could go through that would glorify God and not Peter. I started meditating on that and saying, by what death he should glorify God. And the woman is the glory of the man. And if Christ sacrificed himself for me, then what should I do to glorify him? Maybe I should sacrifice myself for him. Maybe I should reflect the nature of the lamb, be led by the dove, even into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, even to face temptation, even to face trials, even in good times and bad times, and richer and in poor and sickness and in health. If Peter could die a certain death to glorify God, can I go through a trial to glorify God? Can I go through a hard time to glorify God? Can, can God take me through a valley to glorify God? Is there more than one way to get glory out of my life? Amen. He got glory out of Peter's life. Certainly, certainly when, when, he, when he healed the lame man, amen, Peter gave glory to God and God got glory in that. When he walked by and they were healed by a shadow falling on them, God got glory in that. But that wasn't the only way he got glory in Peter's life because there was a death in which he signified what way in his death he could glorify God. And that means I can bring glory to God, not just in my successes, not just in, in just in supernatural things, but I can glorify God even in the way I submit and surrender to his leadership and will for my life. If that's what, Peter gets to the point, God already told him about his death. God told him what way in which he could glorify God. That's why when you read, I think it's in 2 Peter, when Peter talks about his departure, it's no big deal for him. He said, my departure's coming near. It's time for me to leave. Why? Because he knew that that was going to be glorifying God. And he submitted to it. He wasn't backing down. He wasn't complaining. He wasn't leaving the ministry. He didn't decide not to believe in the Messiah anymore. He didn't protect himself, defend himself. He submitted himself. Maybe there's a death for me that I can glorify God. Maybe there's a manner in which I can crucify my own flesh and bring glorify, glorify God. Amen. Maybe it's in more ways than just one. And then I, I love what happens next. It's always amazing to me. He said, verse 19 again, thus spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. Then Peter turned about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter seeing him saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus said unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Do you know that John brought glory to God, but not the same way Peter brought glory to God? God signified by what death 
that Peter could glorify God. But you know that John didn't have to be crucified and John didn't have to die a martyr. John was the only one of the disciples who could die of old age. Amen. And you say, well, maybe he didn't glorify God. No, God had a different way in which he could glorify God. And it was different than the way Peter could glorify God. And Jesus ends up saying, what is that to thee? Follow me. It doesn't matter. And you say, God, how come you healed them and don't heal me? How come they have a nice family and I have family troubles? How come that's a good church? and I'm stuck in this situation. Why do they get a good job and I don't get a good job? What is that to you? Follow him. Just surrender to the headship of your husband. Amen. If you need a good job, he'll give you a good job. Amen. And if he gives you a job that has some degree of suffering, say, praise God, maybe in my death in this job, I can bring glory to God. Maybe in whatever he has to me, let it be to the glory of God. Maybe through the trial, I can bring more glory to him than maybe in a, in a, in a rousing testimony of a supernatural ball of fire. Period. Maybe it's actually walking through this valley and submitting and surrendering and keeping the right attitude. Amen. Maybe that's how he wants me to glorify him. Maybe somebody else will do it by laying hands on a lame man and they leap and jump and walk. Maybe that's how they bring glory to God. But maybe God's designed for me to bring glory to him to suffer through tribulation and trial and, and, and act like a lamb. Yeah. Amen. We don't know. But we know that God knows. Amen. What's that to thee? Peter's saying, well, if I have to be crucified, what does he get? If this is how I'm going to glorify you, what's he going to do to glorify you? And Jesus said, don't you worry about that. Don't you worry about that. You follow me. Oh, what a, that little bitty few few verses there have got me all stirred up inside. Amen. God, if I've got to die, let me die. If you've got, if I need to die to this situation or die to that situation or surrender my will in this or my preference in that, let me crucify the flesh. If that's how you want me to bring glory to your name, then let me be willing like Peter was at the end of his life and say, hey, now it's time. What he said is going to come to pass. It's time for my departure. Because why? I want to have the nature of the lamb. Oh, friends, I don't know. Sometimes I don't know why I even preach like I preach. I want to preach happy things and, and we're all this and that, but there's a reality to our life. Amen. And, and the, the, when Jesus was on earth, amen, he had campaigns and he had healings. And they followed after him and they wanted him, but they also mocked him and made fun of him and spit on him and rejected him and took him in a mock trial and false accusations. And, and, they, and they rejected him as a whole nation and, and they hung him on a cross. And, and, and you talk about wholesale rejection, amen, but he submitted to it. It wasn't always, you know, he glorified his father, not just in the healing, but also on Calvary. When he was spit on and didn't spit back, when he was riled against and didn't rile back, he was bringing glory to his father. And we know testimonies bring glory to God. We know the supernatural in our life brings glory to God, and we want that. But maybe our surrender and sacrifice also brings glory to God. Maybe our submission to the headship of the word, even when it goes against the desire of the flesh, glorifies God. Maybe when I submit myself to the headship of Christ and deny myself, you know what I'm doing? I'm reflecting the nature of the lamb. Because when Christ was on earth, when Jesus Christ was here, he surrendered to the will of the Father. And he only did that which the Father showed him. Amen. And he goes to Gethsemane and he's wrestling with himself. And Brother Branham, he, he, Brother Branham so depicts it so beautifully. If it wasn't for the prophet of God, we wouldn't be able to say these things. But the prophet of God says he's wrestling out. Will he, will he go to Calvary or will he stay with his disciples what he wanted to do? 
Remember what he wanted to do. He, he himself wanted to stay with his disciples. He didn't want the separation. He didn't want the pain and suffering that came. But, or would he obey the Father? Or would he stay with the disciples and do? That's what he wanted to do. But he wrestled it out till he says, not my will, but thine be done. And what was he doing? He's bringing glory to the Father. I say, God, let me bring glory to you. Sometimes... What's hard is he doesn't tell us ahead of time. He told Peter, when you're old, you'll, somebody else will gird you, they'll take you where you want to go, they'll stretch your arms out, and signifying what measure he might die by, how he might glorify God. Sometimes he doesn't tell us ahead of time that you're going to go through a hard time and you're going to suffer, and you're going to suffer a long time, but the way you suffer is going to bring glory to me. The way you die, listen, if we remain on this earth much longer before the translation of the body, many of us are going to die. Make your death glorify God. Die in faith. Die believing. Die in joy looking forward to step to the next dimension. Glorify God in death. Glorify God in life. Glorify God in high times. Glorify God in the low times. Glorify God in much. Glorify God without much. Glorify God in sickness. Glorify God in health. Amen. Amen. Wait, what right do we have to complain? What right do we have to get selfish? Right, right. That's not the nature of the lamb, and that's not what he's called us to reflect. And we are the glory. The woman's the glory of the man. I want to bring glory to my husband, and I want to bring glory to him by reflecting back to him his character. Because the kind of wife a man chooses reflects what's in him, what his nature is, and what he thinks of his future home. And I believe by all my heart he's chose me, so he must know that there's something down inside of me that can reflect his nature and so I know the potentials are there I just have to surrender myself and die to myself and say God by the power of your Holy Ghost would you bring out the reflection of you that must be in me because you chose me I didn't choose me you called me bride I didn't call me bride you said you're coming to unite with me you've come to me I didn't come to you all I did was say "Yea, Lord that's what I want amen now I know that the wife you choose reflects what's inside of you and what you're thinking of your future home so God inside of me is your choice bring it to the surface Lord I surrender, Lord. I surrender. Bring it to the surface. You know what we need? we need? We need the Holy Ghost to move in our lives every day because this isn't something we can do on ourselves. This isn't with sure willpower. This is something that we must resign ourselves to and say, God, I've got to die today. I've got to die tomorrow. I've got to die the next day. But you've got to come and live your own life because if not, I'll be the wrong kind of reflection of your life. And I don't want to hinder I don't want to bring a bag mark against your name. This, this Eve of the last day is not going to fail because she's predestinated not to. Something's already inside of her and he sent his word to draw it out. I say, God, whatever glorifies your name, let me glorify your name. And the masterpiece, he says, now closing in a few minutes, I want you to notice real close of something that just happened. Malachi 4 is to bring back to the original. She is smitten from the church, from the church body, smitten with her master for the same purpose. She is the word, just the same as Joseph was smitten from his brethren because he was the word. And Jesus was smitten from his brethren because he was the word. The church is smitten. The bride is smitten from the church because she is the word. There's your stages again. The word living in an action, the Bible bride, not some man-made bride, the Bible bride, smitten and afflicted of God. Now listen, he goes right to Isaiah 53, which is speaking of Jesus, which is speaking of the lamb, and he applies it to the bride. Now he says, the, bride, the Bible bride, smitten and afflicted of God. No beauty we should desire her, but yet we did esteem her, smitten and afflicted of God. That's right, she stands alone. She is smitten from all the denominations according to Revelation 3. She is smitten out of the Laodicean church age that she was raised up in. That's the church was raised up in the Laodicean church age. That's the husk. 
What are you saying? He says, she is smitten and afflicted of God. Rejected in the church age, rejected from the denominations, and that's how he wants to be glorified in her, in her rejection. Amen. He was rejected, will be rejected. If he was the word, we must be the word. If the word's been rejected and ridiculed and mocked and made fun of and discredited, then what do you think we should expect in our lives? But if my husband is poor, then I'm happy being poor. If my husband is rich, I'm rich. If my husband's going through a good time, I'm going through a good time. If he's going through a bad time, I'm going through a bad time. Why? Because I've surrendered my life to him. My identity is wrapped up in him. If the word was rejected, then I'll be rejected. Why? Because I'm part of him. In the good times and in the bad times. In Romans 8, 35, let's turn there together. I want to read just two more scriptures and we'll close. Romans 8, 35. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Let's read it again. You care if we go back and read it one more time? I love asking that because, I mean, I don't think you're going to say no. You might say it in your heart, but not out loud. Because we think about being married to Christ and being healed and being rich and having the cattle on a thousand hills, but, but let's actually read what Paul says. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. He's a lamb, we're lambs. Amen. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If none of those things will separate us from his love, amen, will we separate ourselves from him because of these things? Or will we stay with him in his love and peril and nakedness and sword and being counted as sheep for the slaughter all the day long? Will we stay united with him? If he goes to the cross, will we go to the cross? If he goes into trial and tribulation, will we go into trial? Will we let the dove lead us into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil to bring glory to God? Or will we say, no, that's not what I signed up for? We go back to our vows. I take thee, Lord Jesus, to be my wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish. I want all of that to be true in my love back to him. Nothing will separate his love from me. I don't want anything to separate my love back from him. Let's go to Philippians chapter three. Philippians chapter three, verse four. Philippians 3 and 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, 
and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. What else do we want in this life but him? And what else do we want to do in this life but glorify him? And there's nothing else I desire but to glorify him and to reflect his nature. But I know that it's gonna take God coming and helping me. But I believe that's the hour we live in, isn't it not? Isn't this the hour for him to manifest himself in bride form? Isn't that the hour we're living in? Is it, we, we, we've talked about it so much, we know that it's true, but we were seeing it in power and demonstration and revelation and all of these things. But, but to me, if I'm gonna see it there, I've also gotta see it in suffering and in rejection and in submission and in a lamb nature. It's got to be both. If I'm going to be his bride, if I'm going to be his wife, I've got to be able to take both sides. Everything that he is, I am. Everything he goes through, I go through. Amen. His rejection is my rejection. His success is my success. And I want to be his glory. And I want to glorify his name on this earth. The only way I can do it is to reflect back his character while I'm in this earth. I never saw Jesus complain to God when somebody rejected him. I never saw him complain to God when trials came. When he went to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, I didn't see him blaming God or complaining to God. I saw him submitting to the leadership of the dove and, and obeying his father in all things. Did we see him as a man wrestle in Gethsemane? Yes, he was a human being. He wrestled in Gethsemane. Did we see him tired? And to, all those things are true. But, but he submitted to the will of the Father and to the leadership of the Father. And what was he on earth? He was a reflection of his Father. He was God in flesh, reflecting the very life of God. What are we on this earth? The reflection of Jesus Christ, our husband. And I want to be a good reflection. You know the kind of wife I want to be? The boxcar wife. The boxcar wife, I, I'm okay, I'm fine, Lord. Everything you give me is wonderful. I'm happy with you. I'm happy with what you give me. I'm pleased with the decisions you make for me. I'm happy with your leadership. I trust in you and I know whatever you lead is best and I'm giving all my faith and trust into you. I wanna be a boxcar wife. I don't wanna reflect the wrong nature. Amen, let's all stand together. There's many, many more things that were on my heart, but I'm gonna save that for another time. And just say that there's no way, there's no way that a lamb can be married to a wolf. There's no way the poor man from the boxcar could have married the rich girl on the hill because he had to pick a wife that reflected his nature. That's why Christ couldn't take a modern denominational to be his wife. That's what Brother Brenham said. He couldn't do it. He had to take one that would reflect his nature, that would be humble and submissive and have faith and trust in him. Amen. I'm so glad that he chose me. I don't feel worthy of it, and I don't feel like I'm, I'm a good reflection, but I know if I surrender to his life, he'll come and do things in me that I can't do myself. All I need to do is surrender to him. I don't need to take it into my own hands. I don't need to solve my own problems. What I need to do is trust in him and let him lead. Amen. Let's bow our heads together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this day. And Lord Jesus, you told Peter by what death he can glorify you. God, it's an amazing scripture to me that things that look negative can bring glory to your name. Things that look bad can be a way in which we can bring glory to your name. Things that the world would call tragedy, maybe a failure, but God, those are ways in which we can glorify your name. When Peter would be tried as a criminal, rejected by governments, hung on a cross to die 
The world would call that failure, but that's how you chose that he would glorify you. God, I, I don't know what you have planned for our lives, but God, may we pledge ourselves to you for better and for worse, for richer and for poorer, in sickness and in health. Lord, I'm sorry for pulling back in bad times. When I got discouraged, got down, I'm sorry, Lord. It's even times, Lord, I tried to fix things myself and I didn't trust you like I should. I wasn't as submissive as should have been. When you said no, I tried to find my own way. And I'm sorry, Lord. But I want, Lord, with all my heart to be a lamb. Yes. Lord, I believe you've called me to be your bride in this hour. I believe it, Lord. I can't help but believe it. God, if I lay my life down, would you pick it up and use it for your glory? If I surrender to you, would you get glory out of my life, Lord? And God, I pray that you encourage my faith. And yes. Draw out of me, Lord, all the attributes you've placed in and help me to be shaped into your very image, to grow into your stature, to the fullness of you, Lord. God, may I be a reflection on this earth of your life, Lord, and help me, Lord, to stay submissive and trusting, to reflect you on this earth, to say, Lord, your way is the right way and your will is the best and what you choose is what I want. God, I pray that you put that in my life, put that in my mouth, put it in my mind. Help me submit to it, Lord. God, there's times I've acted fussy and complaining and I repent for it, Lord. Because I recognize every choice you've made for me is the right choice. And every valley you took me through was needful. And every trial was on purpose with an intent for your glory, for my shaping, to be molded into your image. And I say, God, I'm thankful for everything that you have allowed in my life. And I trust you. And everything that has happened, I trust you. And everything that's happening, Lord, I trust you. And everything that will happen, I want to trust you, Lord. Let your glory be made manifest in our surrender. And God, may we be your reflection on this earth. For that's what you, your prophet preached is the age that we live in. And what you're trying to accomplish. Because you didn't finish all of your work in your earthly journey, but you left some of it to do in and through your bride. God, I want to surrender to you so that you can finish that work in this day and that you can get all the glory. I love you, Father. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your mercy, for your graciousness. God, how can we not be patient in trial when you've been so patient with us? How can we not endure with what you allow when you've endured with us for years and years and years? You've been patient with us how can we not reflect back to you patience and endurance? God, you've loved us even when things go wrong and when we've done wrong. How can we not love you when things go wrong, seemingly? God, how can we not reflect back to you the same love you've given to us? God, I love you. I thank you and I trust you. Moving forward, Lord, we don't know what the future holds and what our what path our journey will take us. No doubt many of us will go different ways. For you had a path for Peter and a way at the end of his life he could glorify you, but it was different for John. And may each one of us maybe have a different way in which our surrender and our sacrifice of ourselves can bring glory to you. But God, help us not to look to the other. Help us not to compare. But help us to look to you only and trust in you only. For Lord, all that you do is good and all that you do is right. You have a purpose and a plan in it all. And God, we want to be a reflection of you on this earth. Help us, God, I pray. As we part and go our ways tonight, may we walk out of here determined to make our pledge to you and to live it. Whether we understand or don't understand, whether it feels good or doesn't feel good, Lord, we've pledged ourselves to you. And we trust you. 
we're surrendered to you. And you are ahead, and we love you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you, Brother Joel.
thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and it told your love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou Oh, the pure delight of us.